the muzzleloaders.com podcast, your source for all things muzzleloading. Welcome back to another episode of the Muzzleloaders podcast. Today we are with Verlin, and it's just Verlin and I today. We're just gonna, us. Yep, and Verlin and I have been talking a lot about elk hunting, and I got to thinking, why don't we just record a podcast instead of sitting around talking about it? So, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so we well record it if we're going to talk about it. Exactly. Get the, get the content, provide some of your wisdom for the people of the muzzle loaders podcast. Um, so we're going to do like an FAQ, uh, type podcast. We're going to talk about some questions and I'm relatively new to elk hunting. And so Verlin and I have a lot of questions. He's very experienced. So I ask a lot of these novice questions. I figured that would be helpful for you guys to know if you have a Colorado hunt planned or uh, another muzzleloader hunt, something like that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our conversation today. So some of the first, I just kind of went through and I wrote down some of the questions that I have and that I've asked you in the past and things like that. And some of the things that you've talked about in your um, seminars. And the first one is, I want to know how your season has gone thus far, because it just started here this past weekend. And uh, I know that I had a slow weekend, um, and some people was kind of hit and miss. Some people had really good weekends. Other people had slow weekends. So how how have you uh, been doing so far? Well, I went out uh, Friday night after work and headed for the mountains and uh-huh. uh, spent the night, and um, it got so cold I had to wear a hat <laughs> to get to sleep. Uh-huh. It was, I think, 27 degrees when I woke up on Saturday morning, frost on the ground. I'm thinking, oh, man, September is hit. This is yeah. going to be awesome. And, uh, so I plunged into the, into the back country and, uh, nothing. Hmm. I mean, nothing. All the wallows that I usually go to up there, uh, there wasn't even an elk track in it. Like they didn't even come drink out of it, let alone get in it and wallow around in it. Um, I saw nothing. I didn't see an animal. I didn't see an elk, a deer. I don't even, I think I heard one squirrel, didn't even see a squirrel. And I covered some miles. Mm -hmm. I just like, man, it was just dead. I didn't jump anything. Found an old dead five point bull elk antler all chewed up and everything like really? that but yeah chewed up by squirrels or yeah just animals yeah, yeah. it was it's been there a couple of years it looks oh. like it's all drug out and it's chewed up pretty good but anyway yeah other than that um it was just a good hike and mm-hmm. uh, that's really a good way to start the season is just get out there and get your legs underneath you i like to get my legs underneath me a little earlier than that but uh building the house and everything this last year i've kind of been preoccupied with yeah. that rather than uh thinking about elk 365 yeah you know? <laughs> so, like, there are there are other things in life that you have to do so sure yeah but yeah but no it's pretty slow yeah and if for somebody as avid of an elk hunter as you how do you rank like hunting versus personal life versus you know how does that balance work how has it worked in the past versus now where do, what do you think is healthy because i think that a lot of our listeners are avid hunters and uh you know it's totally understandable to be passionate about something right what is the balance yeah and that's something you kind of go through in your life on every aspect of your life um mm-hmm. whether it's uh, wh- wh- anything i mean whatever your passions are you do have to you have to bring those into um, a level to where everything works and, yeah. and life is very fragile and uh, you start letting one thing go um, if you get something like over your marriage mm-hmm. then things are not going to work out real well I mean yeah. they just you know that's just miserable uh, more than just that one month you went hunting it's it carries on into other things so uh, there were times in my life when I think hunting became a little bit too too important Mm -hmm. and I was letting a lot of things in my life just kind of go oh man when this is over then I can concentrate on all that stuff but that's really not how the reality of it is the reality of it is if you've caused you've caused uh, other issues um, because you let too many other things become too important Mm -hmm. and so a lot of times yeah it's just a, a stage of life that we go through uh, when you're younger, you got more ambition to go just, uh, you know, get her done and do mm, stuff yeah. and or whatever it is. I mean, it doesn't have to be, it could be golf, you know, you don't have to be hunting. It could be anything that just takes over your life. And, and so, um, hunting is just one of those things and, and hunting is a passion of mine. I mean, mm-hmm, don't get me yeah. wrong. I mean, it's, it's something I have to really keep in check because I, I really, really, really enjoy it. 
Um, but my whole life doesn't wrap around it. Um, yeah. Like I think it has in the past in some, in a lot of areas. So. Yeah. I think the key to life is moderation because too much of any good thing is always going to be a bad thing. And I like to use food as an example because you can have a really delicious meal and you can eat to a certain point. But if you eat past that point, you rob yourself of the blessing, you get sick, you get the meat sweats, you know, and you get fat. And so (laughs) there's always a healthy balance to everything. And I think with hunting, it can be, it tends to be really addicting and it's important to really be honest with yourself. And I think being honest with the people around you to try and find that balance. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, that's, that really is key because like I say, it can be, it doesn't have to be hunting. It can be golf. It can be food. Mm-hmm. It can be, it can it literally, I mean, it can be, it can be good things. Um, you know, working out, um, yeah. when I was, when I was bodybuilding, um, it became one of those things I had to do in the morning and in the evening and doing six days a week. And it's mm-hmm. just like, it became a big deal. And, uh, that, and I think as far as physically, I felt good, but a lot of other things in my life were just kind of crumbling around my ears and I didn't even really mm-hmm. catch on to it. So, um, yeah, to keep everything in that, in that moderation, um, Life is, like I said, is, is fragile. Every every part of it is is something that you have to put your best into. Uh, and then, of course, when kids come along, then you've got then you've got that responsibility. Something's got to give. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't swing the same the same bat <laughs> as, yeah. at a, at a curveball because all of a sudden it just like oh it, 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 something catches you off guard. And there's nothing, especially your family. Your family's got to be um, right up there at the top of the of the food chain because um, if that goes bad, everything goes bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you just can't you can't operate um, around that outside of that and and let some things go mm-hmm. um, because well you know you just get things can get miserable pretty quick. Yeah, and then ha- life's just not happy. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah, I think that it's important to have a plan because your family does need to be the first priority. And when your family goes South, then nothing else is going to be as enjoyable as possible, you know? And there's something too, I think of in, in men that we want to protect our families. We want to be there for our families innately. And I think that there's like a self betrayal that can happen where you want your, in the moment you want your desires more than you want that. And so um, it's important to be disciplined because in the moment you're going to want to go elk hunting, but you need to determine like, okay, well, these are my priorities and this is how I'm going to have my life balanced out. And that's going to look differently for every person because every person has different responsibilities. Yeah. And I think you hit, I think you hit a real particular word is discipline. Mm-hmm. Discipline in anybody's life is really where it lies. Um, because if you can discipline yourself to do certain things, especially when it's not enjoyable, Mm -hmm. there are, there are benefits to that that will last a lifetime because you'll be able to overcome a lot of other things by disciplining yourself to do what is necessary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I think that, I think that's probably a a key word that you hit on right there is discipline. It's just because that just carries on with it because there are times when you just don't feel like getting up and, and doing something. Mm-hmm. You don't feel like getting up at five o'clock in the morning and going exercising, but you do it. You don't mm-hmm. feel like going out and shooting a hundred arrows a night, because, but you just do it because that's, it's, it's a discipline that just takes, takes discipline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that, like you say, that factors right into hunting. You know, yeah. you have to be disciplined in hunting as well. Yeah. Yep. And again, you know, that's, and that's, that's kind of one of my things, you know, people uh, say, well, you know, how much time have you spent behind the glass as far as, you know, shooting, mm-hmm. um, it, they're long range shooters. They pride themselves on shooting long range. I can shoot a thousand yards and kill an elk or deer or whatever, but they ha- don't spend much time behind it. Got to, It's a discipline that you have to get out there and spend some mm-hmm. time behind the glass because it does kind of fade. Um, I try to get it out and shoot a hundred arrows every mm-hmm. night. Um, year round, it, it takes discipline to, oh, I got to bundle up, get out in the snow and shoot, mm-hmm. shoot a hundred arrows, you know, it's like, oh, you got to be kidding me or bring it, even bring your stuff into the garage and shoot, mm-hmm. you know, at 10 yards or whatever. But, uh, it just keeps that, that discipline, um, 
uh, in anything of your life. And so mm-hmm. the things that are really important in your life, um, you have to discipline yourself to do. Um, if you're, if you're disciplined, if you really want your family to be um, a tight knit group, you have to discipline yourself to spend time with your kids, spend time with quality time. I'm not mm-hmm. just talking about they're just here. Well, we're all watching TV together. That, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about disciplining yourself to really get down with your kids and get in their life on where they're at in life, especially when they start getting into teenagers. We start thinking that that teenagers are kind of drifting off into their own own world, and so we just kind of let them go. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we need to draw that back and say, okay, let's – let's spend some time together and and get to know your kid again because Mm -hmm. a lot of times we we get into those years and we just kind of let them just drift on into wherever they're going to go in life and they still they still need good parents yeah they still need parenting they still need guidance they still need you know and i'm not talking about you know chopping their allowance because they didn't do the dishes i'm talking about some real serious stuff in life that that that's going to have to happen um, to get them prepared for life. And so mm-hmm. I know I kind of get off subject, but uh, discipline I think is, yeah. is, is key. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's good times to go off subject. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're talk- yeah. It's important to talk about balance, you know, yes. and I think that's, that's a key part of life, a key part of hunting. It's what's going to give you success in both. And yeah. so, yeah. Um, but you know, I think, I think that it's kind of a good segue as well into some of the questions that we have. And so I did want to talk about, um, you know, our, our listeners are primarily muzzleloader hunters. You have a lot of experience archery hunting and, and muzzleloader hunting. And so what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see new elk hunters make, um, you know, during archery season, during muzzleloader season, like later in the year, post rut, like what are some of the things that are, are going on that you see? Okay. Um, yeah. And since, Right now, of course, right now everything is is geared for archery, and most most hunters are just give me a tag and I'll hunt that. You <laughs> yeah, <know>? so, <laughs> multifaceted. I will I will archery hunt. I will muzzleload hunt. I will rifle hunt. I will do whatever it takes to hunt. Yeah, and so just give me a tag, mm-hmm. and so we're we're ambidextrous in that way that we can just take up a weapon and and take off, but. Um, so, so right now, as far as common mistakes for archery hunters, uh, I think are not stopping the animal, uh, especially if, uh, especially if you're not experienced and we're mm-hmm. talking about not, not experienced people, um, stop the animal is important. And, and I, and I stress over and over and over how important that is. And uh, yesterday I had some kids in here from out of state and they were coming to elk hunt for the first time. There's five of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's, I want them to be successful, but I want them to be successful in the right way. I want them not to. In an ethical way. Yes. And not have to learn from a mistake that Mm -hmm. lost animal and they just spend, hopefully they'll spend, you know, half of the seat, half the rest of the, cause they're here for 10 days. So anyway, they just, they just didn't have a read. And so I said, well, what are you going to do to stop the animal? Well, we have a guy that's doing all our calling. I'm just like, no, what are you going to do to stop the animal? Cause he's going to walk right past you and walk mm-hmm. to the, walk to the collar. And they never even thought about that. And they're Turkey hunters. They're from back East. They're Turkey hunters and whitetail hunters. They're archery mm-hmm. hunters, but they've never done elk before. And so uh, I told them, I said, you know, it's, it's one thing to try and stop an animal. And you hear this all the time and it works, but you know, they'll be at full drawn. Oh, here he comes, here he comes. He's not stopping. So I get quack or whack or me quack or hey, or something, you know, and it's just not natural. Mm-hmm. And so they might, I mean, they freeze. You can see every muscle in their and fiber of their being just go, what was that? <laughs> and they may, and, you know, they may give you a second to shoot, but they if might it's, jump string or whatever. Yeah, it's just like, man, they look right at you and it's just like, oh, that's not natural. And so I was trying to tell them, I said, you know, get a reed in your mouth. And they're turkey hunters, so they know how to use a reed. And I told them, you know, showed them how to how to make a call, just a just a cow call. Mm-hmm. And they could do it. That they're they're good with it. But I said, man, that thing should never leave your mouth because if you do something natural, it's not so surprising. He's already coming in looking for elk anyway. Mm-hmm. And so when he comes in, have that, just that, you know, that, 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 just that soft calf or cow call. 
and they just kind of stop and look over in your direction. Usually I'm on my knees when I shoot, and they're looking right over the top of me. They're not even looking for me. They're looking for another elk. And so the most common mistake I, I see in, in beginners is just not stopping the animal. Mm-hmm. And they think that just because they're walking, they're going really slow. Oh, my arrow is going to get there. Well, yeah, arrow takes a bit to get there. It's not like a rifle. As soon as you pull the trigger, it's there in, in 20 yards. It's like one step of an elk is three three feet. You know, it's yeah. just like all of a sudden now you go from a perfect shot to a gut shot, and now you lost your animal. So mm-hmm. um, that's one of the most common mistakes, and I think that's – and that could be with muzzle loaders too. I try to stop my animal or keep the animal stop um, before I pull the trigger. Um, just for any kind of delayed reaction at all, I want everything yeah. to go perfect. And because your room they, for error really decreases when the animal's considerably. moving considerably, and you get a little more time to focus on where you're shooting exactly where you're mm-hmm. shooting. Um, most people don't practice at moving animals or moving targets. You know, they're not they're pr- they don't primarily. You sit down on a on a bench and you man you pinpoint that oh man i'm hitting man i can shoot a one inch group at 100 yards and uh it's just like wow that's good but if that mm-hmm. animal's walking yeah all of a sudden that one inch group becomes a 18 20 inch group or mm-hmm. whatever yeah um and plus all the nerves that are in it and then i told these kids yesterday i said you're gonna have to take into consideration um especially on, and this is what i say on my on my uh seminars is that Whatever you can hit 10 times out of 10 on a grapefruit-sized target, that should be your maximum distance. Mm-hmm. So if you can shoot 20 at 20 yards, you can hit, hit uh, 10 out of 10 shots at a grapefruit-sized target, and you go to 30 and all of a sudden it becomes a basketball, then 20 yards should be your maximum. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, 10 <laughs> times out of 10. And they go, well, yeah, but your kill zone's way bigger than a grapefruit. It's like this. I said, yes, but you take into consideration that adrenaline. you've got adrenaline. you got the elk coming in, he's screaming and tearing stuff up, and you're all excited, and you're going, you're lucky if you hit the elk, yeah. you know, and well, I see it all the time. You know, I aim small, miss small. It's like, if yeah. you aim, it's like, well, if it's this big, that's all I got to hit, then you're going to hit yeah. guts or yeah. you're going to hit something, yeah. you, know, you know. If you aim for something like this and you miss out a little bit, you're still in, a, you're still in good right. shape, you right. know. So that's that's just some of the things I see, you know, uh, especially beginners just make uh, those kind of mistakes. Um, once you get, uh, and I still, I mean, I've been, I'm 60 years old and I've been doing this since I was nine. And I've been bow hunting since I was 14. Mm-hmm. And uh, I still, when that first bull of the year comes screaming in, tearing stuff up, I still get this, yeah, <laughs> this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You know, I just, and I still get that. I still get that rush out of it. Yep. And I, I love that. You know, I don't want that to ever leave, you know, and later on in the season, you know, cause I draw back on, on stuff all during the season just for practice and it starts getting my nerves to where it's just like, okay, I know when to draw. I practice, you know, okay, if this was okay, a spike is coming in I, he's coming in I'm go, okay, this is where I draw. He'd get his head behind there. I draw back. And then he walks out and go, okay, that was good. That was good form. That's all, that all worked mm-hmm. out how to do. And so I practice on those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> you need to be really careful about that because stuff can go wrong when you're, when you're uh, drawing back on animals. Mm-hmm. Um, you can bump a trigger. You can, you know, <laughs> yeah. you could do stuff. Uh, I actually have a story about that, but um, so I have this, I have this, bull in 2012 we call it the oops bull <laughs> and uh <laughs> it's kind of uh, and i do that I, I draw back i draw back i draw back well I, I had this bull i called him in he's a six point bull but he wasn't quite what i what i wanted i had a, a really nice seven point bull earlier in the day in that morning that that i really wanted and some other hunters kind of fouled that up and ruined it for me but <clears throat> it happens it's public property or public <laughs> land <laughs> So I call this bull in, he comes in, I, I draw back on him, he's at 15 yards, and I let down, I go, oh man, that's perfect. He ca- actually came right up, and he was five yards away from me, and he's right in front of me, and he's just screaming, he's, he's looking for this elk that should be here, and I'm on my knees, and he screams right over the top of me, and go, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and then, of course, I didn't say anything, because he was wide open right there, looking right over the top of me, so I just held and waited, and he turns, and 
goes back to where he came. And as soon as he got on the other side of that tree, I drew back. And I, as soon as he started coming out, I, you know, just a real small calf call. And he's and his seven yards, I was at full draw at him like this. And I'm going, oh, man, you're a lucky bull. And then I held and held and held. And he got bored. And he just took off walking. Got out there to 15 yards. I stopped. I did it again. Did it again. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I held it right on his heart. Like, you know, if this is my shot, I would put it right there and shoot. And got out there at 40 yards. I'd already put my arrow away and everything. And he got out there at 40 yards, and he's going into the timber. And he walked out into this, about the size of this room, and the sun was just shining down on him. And it was just timber everywhere uh-huh. else, but it was just this wide open thing. And it was just like, whoa, you know, the angels <laughs> saying. And he was just, and I took my arrow out, and I drew back, and I go, oh, that's 40 yards, man. I just stick it right on his heart like that. And all of a sudden, boom there went the arrow <laughs> and I go, oh no 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 and i didn't i mean i don't even remember bumping the trigger or nothing it just went and sure enough it stuck him right in the top of the heart and he was dead in less than 18 <laughs> yards and he's over there flipping and flopping i'm going oh no <laughs> i call my wife she's at she's at disneyland and i said uh oops and she goes oh no i bet he did something that he didn't was gonna regret so she calls me and she goes what happened i said I just shot this six point bull on accident. She goes, You're the only one that shoots a six point bull on accident. I said, But my season is over now. I got to wait till I go to Idaho, you know, for that. But so, anyway, uh, yeah, you got to be really careful about, you know, uh, drawing back on yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but I do it all the time. I, I do practice it. I don't do it on cows anymore, just in case that does happen, because I. Mm-hmm. It, that can happen. I yeah. mean, it just can happen. A loop can break or anything. Mm-hmm. And I've been at my house practicing before and have a loop break and, you know, nearly shoot the side of my house or whatever. Yeah. It, it happens. So I don't know how we got off on that, but it's a yeah. fun story anyway. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the that's Oops Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I kind of along those lines, what are some things that you wish you knew when you first started elk hunting when you're nine years old that you would know now? Everything I just explained. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, but back then, you know, it was, it was a lot different because you could, we didn't even have these fancy bugle tubes and stuff, you know. We had, we had little fluty things that looked like copper tubes and we just, and they'd really? answer. Oh, yeah. My dad, I remember the first time I ever recall, dad had a 30 odd 6 shell. And he just, you know how you kind of yeah. blow on the top and it just squealed. This bull came across the canyon at a dead run, screaming. And I'm just like, like we're going to get <laughs> freight trained here. You know, I was probably eight years old or something, eight or uh-huh. nine years old. And this bull just come running in. And this is this was in October because my dad was an archery hunter. He's a rifle hunter. Mm-hmm. And uh, mid-October, I mean, this bull came on a string. He just was ready to have a fight. And my dad just pulled up and shot him, you know, 300 <laughs> weather beam magnum at 10 yards. I'm just like, man, this is like, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> but things were just different then. Mm-hmm. And even when I really started getting into archery hunting, you know, when I was 14, 15 years old, um, animals just came in easier. There, not a lot of people were... We're doing it like we do now. A lot of spot and stock stuff was going on, but not a lot of people were really getting figured out how to how to squeal them in, mm-hmm. you know. But well, now they're very educated. They're they, very educated. If you don't do it exactly perfect, then they'll figure it out. Yep. And that's kind of like you know when the hoochie mama come out, you know, mm-hmm. everybody was using wait 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 wait, <laughs> and it's just and it worked. I mean, it worked for four or five years. And then I don't know if they just got a used to the tone or something but all of a sudden the hoochie mama just i I mean there's still people who use them in it on occasion it might work but for the most part they just don't work like they used Mm -hmm. to and uh the way that i'm calling elk now um is not the same way i did it 10 years ago it's i i you have to change with what they're doing and you have to learn what they're saying and and uh certain parts of the season now it used to work the same thing pretty much worked all september but now it's kind of like uh now i've kind of uh educated myself how to move with the rut and how to call um early season rather than and versus late season 
and uh, how to get the herd bull. And that's that's kind of my goal is to mm-hmm. is to get the herd bull. Not necessarily. He doesn't have to be a giant. And I, I've had these conversations lots of times about you know because I do kill. I, I've been very fortunate to to have taken some really good animals uh, year mm-hmm. after year, and uh, it's become more instead of the big part of it because how big they are isn't the experience i think it's very very important that i say this because mm-hmm. i know people who are embarrassed they've killed a maybe their first bull and it's a little raghorn three by four mm-hmm. there's nothing like that. I mean, that feeling your first bull you it's a it's the it, it could have been a, a, a 400 bull mm-hmm. you get the same excitement because it's just overwhelmingly exciting and so I, I hate it when people come up to me and they say, uh, and you know, they say, well, did you get a bull? I said, yeah, I got a bull. And I said, did you get a bull? Like, well, yeah, but he's really nothing to talk about. Uh-huh. And it was this first or second bull, you know, I'm just like, what do you mean? It's not, was it, was it exciting? Did it, yeah. did it, did it do everything that you wanted to do inside? Mm-hmm. It didn't matter how big it was. And so I, I really started reevaluating how I hunt uh, rather than just going big or go home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's now I have bucket list things. And, um, in 2016, I had one of those bucket list things happen. Um, because there are certain hunts that I'm just really after, and it's not necessarily how big anymore. Uh, so in 2016, I have always dreamt of this and I've, you know, you, you have certain hunts that just like this and, no other words to really say other than to romance the situation. Yeah. It's this real romantic hunting experience. <laughs> and uh, I've always dreamed of, you know, uh, you see pictures of, uh, especially like at Yellowstone, you know, and this big bull just materializes out of the fog. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, here comes the antlers and stuff. You know, I just, oh man, that is just the coolest thing. I would, I love to experience that. Well, we don't have a lot of foggy days mm-hmm. here in Oregon in September. Uh, especially the first 15, 16 days before I head for Idaho. I only get 15, those 15 days here. And then I head for Idaho. And uh, one morning I got up and it was just fog to the ground. And yeah. I mean, couldn't see 50 yards. You bugle, it feels like it's just going to yeah, hit in the mm, ground, you that's know. That's cool. It, it was. And it's just like, oh, man, this is just, this is, oh, man, this this just never happens. And so I bugle, and I hear this little faint bugle. I go, man, he's got, he can't be very far because it just doesn't travel that far in fog, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking he's probably pretty close. And so I go about 10 steps further to try and get in a better position. Uh, and then all of a sudden I see this bull come just like, oh, this is just like the dream, you know. This bull comes out of the out of the timber, and I see antlers materializing. I'm going, oh man, this is the hunt I'm waiting for. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to shoot this bull. And then another bull comes right behind him and another bull comes right behind him. Another bull comes right out behind Uh him. I'm just like, in September, I want a video. Yeah. In September. Really? Yeah. So they're, they're all these, basically they're all a bunch of raghorn bulls Mm -hmm. really have no place to go. And this is early season too. So they're not really heavy, heavy rut, you know? So I think this is on the third of September. So it's early. And so they're still together and they're coming out and they're coming out and they're, and they're walking right towards me and they're just kind of, you know, just that, just mm-hmm. like, oh man, this, I am going to shoot one of these bulls. And the very last one out was a decent six point bull. Yeah. And so I thought, well, of course, you know, that's the one I'm going to uh, target. You know, I'm just, I am going to take the biggest one I can out of the group, but it wouldn't have mattered. And uh, so they're coming and that year I switched to left-handed um, mm-hmm. just because, I wanted to. And so I, I bought a left-handed bow and I became very proficient at it. And, but I thought, okay, you know, everything considered 40 yards is, is, is max as I'm going to take a shot. You know, I'm fairly in the open and there, and there's kind of this cliffy, it's not, you know, not, you know, hundred yards down there. It's just a cliff that's about 20 yards deep. Mm-hmm. And I'm right on this rock line like this. And they came out and they came out on the bottom of that. And I, I'm shooting left-handed, but I had positioned myself right-handed. I had, I even had my bow in my right hand, but I positioned myself this way. Mm. And they started coming up, up that, 
little draw and they started fingering off up to the top right in front of me about 20 yards away and i'm thinking oh, i'm shooting left-handed <laughs> I, I i've got to turn my whole body uh -huh. to get you know from here over to here and four out of five of them came up that one well the biggest one he never showed up i thought well that's kind of weird but they're 23 yards and they're they're not even looking at me. they just keep walking right up and wait and wait and wait and i'm thinking man i'm gonna have to switch my I'm gonna have to switch my body here pretty quick and he never came up and then i could see down off this edge this antlers were coming off mm -hmm. off to the left of me and so i swung all the way around and he's coming over on this side of me now he's already past me and coming up the next shoot all by himself and uh turned around and ended up shooting him at 23 yards and uh, he just ran down off the hill and he's dead right down over the edge and and just like oh, it was just one of those things just like <laughs> oh and the fog was just you know it, it just happened just like you always dream of this uh -huh. super cool thing ever happening and so those are the kind of things and and i i was tickled pink and overwhelmed even though he was a smaller six point bull elk, I was overwhelmed by the experience because yeah. it was just like, this is what I've always just, this is one of my dream hunts, you mm -hmm. know, to, to be able to do this. And, uh, I, that's, that's memorable to me mm -hmm. more than some of the bigger bulls that I've killed just because of that experience was just like, it's just like, there was, you can't make this scenario happen on your own this has to happen all by the natural things that are around you yeah and uh so i've got you know i've got a couple more bucket list things that i'm trying to accomplish and, and it's very difficult mm -hmm. uh, because one of them is i want to try to shoot a bull while they're fighting and i've only seen wow. <laughs> three fights in my whole life being out there so that's a pretty tall order mm -hmm. and it won't make any difference how big it is if i can get if i can get in that situation i yeah. would love to have that happen um and there's there's a couple more but anyway i don't even know how i got up on that subject but uh <laughs> it's just it's just one of those experiences the nature of a conversation yeah that's so nice. yeah bucket list so bucket list things it was just one of those things that um they're rare occasions mm -hmm. that really make it special. For sure. To kill an elk is not a rare occasion for me. That's that's not a rare occasion. But to have one happen just in this really super cool way that has never happened before, probably never happen again, those are the experiences I'm more after. Yeah. And uh, I would not be embarrassed to say, I got, a, I got this three by two <laughs> bull fighting you know yeah, it's just yeah. like it just be just one of those stories you know it's uh -huh. just like it, i have a lot of those stories that are just unusual and fun and it doesn't matter how big it is and, yeah. and for sure do not be embarrassed to, and i tell everybody who comes in i don't care if you shoot a cow on a youth hunt i want your cow up here on my brag board mm -hmm. um, because to watch that kid light up it may be his first elk or whatever to watch that kid light up and when he's holding those ears on a on a cow mm -hmm. grinning from ear to ear dude your feeling of killing a 400 bull isn't any different than that kid shooting his first first cow yeah mm -hmm. don't be embarrassed by what you, it's it's an accomplishment it's something that that you enjoy doing it it's something that is life satisfying don't be embarrassed because it's not big as somebody big name is you know it's, yeah you don't for one you don't have that opportunity um to to pay lots of money to to have those kind of hunts mm -hmm. or you don't have the time to put in uh like i do uh so what yeah it, it's an experience that you don't forget and it's 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 well worth it mm -hmm. so never be embarrassed about well it wasn't big enough then why'd you shoot it if it's yeah. if it's <laughs> if it's nothing that you're that you're proud of then don't do it throw the meat yeah. in the freezer and shut up about it i guess <laughs> <laughs> but don't be embarrassed about it it's, yeah. an, it's an accomplishment so that kind of is a perfect segue into our next little segment here so we're going to do our blowing smoke segment <clears throat> and so i wanted i looked up what the world record american elk is and i am going to put the over under at 460 inches 
do you think it is larger than that or do you think it is smaller than that well what do i got to look at nothing you just have to guess it's like a a guess of like do you think that there is a bowl that was larger than 460 inches or do you think there's a bowl that it, do you think it would be smaller than that uh, I think it's going to be smaller than that. You think so? What What would you say? Uh, just under 450, 440 something. 440? Okay. Yeah. I so, mean, that's not a farm elk. I mean, I know that's farm yes. elk that go 500. <laughs> yes, <laughs> not a farm elk. Yeah, yeah those are the. Out there. Yeah, yeah that's. <laughs> those, are, those are totally different. Um, This is like the Boone and Crockett uh, world record elk. And then I'm just talking like overall mass. It's not, this is like the non typical overall growth or oh, non-typical yeah case. Uh, they might have been through 460 then yeah so the the world record non-typical l currently is 478 and some change and it it's called the spider bowl and it's oh, just yeah, huge from Utah. I'll, yep yeah, i'll, I'll yeah. put a i'll yeah, put a picture of it on the screen for our viewers sorry i didn't have one for you i actually but. watched that hunt <laughs> oh did you yeah really yeah i bet that was was it an, was it an impressive hunt uh, yeah, I mean it's, I mean that bull is just amazing. I mean, yeah. So you can't take anything away from yeah. that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, it's a high dollar hunt, but it's it's cool. Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's a great. That's a great bull. Yeah, for sure. It's the best bull. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's the world record. It doesn't get much better. <laughs> <laughs> Top awesome. of the line. Yeah. So that's our blowing smoke, um, and. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, speaking the language. So we have had conversations and we see it all the time with hunters in the rut. They go out and it's the first day of season and they're just just screaming, grunting, you know, <laughs> like just wanting yeah. to fight opening day yeah. of season, yeah. you know, before the rut really gets going. Um, and you've talked a lot in your elk calling seminars about speaking the language because elk are very vocal, social creatures and they talk to each other. And so could we go over a little bit of, you know, just kind of a brief overview because it's a very in-depth thing, but like a brief overview of what that is. Okay. Um, first of all, speaking the language was made by Will Primos. Uh, mm. That's kind of his, his line. Um, so I don't want to take anything away from yeah. that for one. <laughs> speaking the language is, is he's well known for speaking yeah. the language um, on all his uh, videos and stuff. Uh, but yeah, speaking the language, speaking their language, particularly, you have to know as you go through the rut, um, what they're trying to say. And that's the important part of if you're going to go early season versus late season, uh, a lot of people take that last bit of season, like the last two weeks off of season. So uh, in September, so they can mm -hmm. get in on a full the full meal deal of the rut um, because that's the most vocal, funnest, uh, you know, you get to see a lot, chase a lot, hear a lot. Yeah. But a lot of people don't know how to close that deal right there um, because it's hard to get that, that, that herd bull away from his cows. Mm -hmm. um, so I have been trying to, especially since I have to get my hunt here done early in September, because I go to Idaho every year, um, I have had to develop how to uh, fill my tag um, earlier mm -hmm. versus later, because uh, there were years when it went by, and I just began to look at all my tags, and it's just like September 21, 22, 23, September 22, 21, 23, 23, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. It's just like they all they all landed on the same day, yeah. year after year after year. Within those three days, 21, 22, 23. It was always it was always that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to I had to figure something out to to say okay I, I there's got to be a way that in early September. I've got to be saying the wrong thing because I'm one of those guys that would go out there, you know, Hey, I'm yeah. out here. Answer me. You know, this is August 27th. You know, it's just like, Hey, I'm out here. <laughs> you know, it's just like, just to put it in English. But, uh, so it's just like, so it began this whole process of trying to figure out what the elk are saying early season versus later season. And I began to, 
spend a whole lot more time paying attention rather than me running the show when I get out there, let them run the show and figure it out. Mm -hmm. So just by being out there watching and listening what they're doing early season versus late season, when do they want to hear what I have to say? Because I was saying the same thing the whole time, but I Mm -hmm. wasn't speaking their language until... I was in that part of the rut where it's just like, now they're, now I'm saying whatever they want to say because yeah. now it's happening. Mm-hmm. So I had to figure out how to do stuff earlier. So um, in early season, when they are um, rubbing off their velvet, mm-hmm. uh, just kind of gearing up, they're still, they're still not ruddy, but they yeah. know what's coming, especially the big bulls. They know what's coming. Um, so in early season, I start doing the things that they do as a bull. They go in, they, they're just getting their velvet shook off and they're really not super aggressive, but they want to start getting a pecking order in in order. Mm -hmm. They want to start showing some dominance. They're starting to um, rub trees and, and mark territory and not like a, not like a white tail does, but, they're, they're getting themselves out there. And so a lot of times, especially early season, last, I mean, the first few days, especially that first week when it opens up in August, mm-hmm. 20th and whatever, um, I go in and I will get to a place that I know there's usually elk here. Or if I just smell, if I, if I walk and all of a sudden I smell elk, that means they were just here. That's something, something's mm-hmm. right here. I will, I will hit the brakes right there and just stop. And I'll just sit there for a minute, just in case I did bump them. They didn't run out because I would have hurt them. So they, they just kind of moved off because they didn't know what was coming in. And so I'll start right there and go, okay, something was here. A lot of times you can smell that ruddy smell of a bull. It's a little more pungent than a cow, a bunch of cows. They smell a certain way and a bull smells a way. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll figure that out. And uh, so I'm not just going to sit here and say, okay, uh, smell this. This is what this is what cows <laughs> smell. I smell this. This is what bulls smell like. That reminds me of another story, which we don't have time to do, but it's funnier than I'll get out. We have to do that one one day. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, the difference between a cow and a bull. <clears throat> yeah. But anyway, um, so I'll get in there and I'll just let everything calm down. I'll stop um, and then just I'll let out a I'll let out a couple just a real small light cow calls, just. Just real lightweight, just to let them know that oh, whatever bumped them out, they're one of us. Mm-hmm. It's not a, it's not a predator because if I came in too quiet, predators always come in quiet. I I usually make a lot of noise. I'll snap branches and stuff. Um, I don't worry about noise when I'm elk hunting at all. Mm-hmm. Um, if I come in quiet and I snap one branch and I just stop everything, and they're listening, if they pick that up, and it doesn't make another sound. That means predator to them because predators are quiet. Predators come in sneaky and stealthy, mm-hmm. and so they don't want it. They don't want that to happen. So I'll I'll walk in, do my do my uh, cow call. If I've like I say, if I if I feel like something just moved off, I didn't hear him run off or anything. So I'll just do that, and then I'll introduce um, maybe a bull now because mm-hmm. if if it is if it's the cow smell, that's one thing. I don't want them to all run off and spook the whole thing. But if it's a bull smell, I walk in and go, "Oh yeah, mm-hmm. there was a bull or two or three or four or five. Because they're still, they're still all ganged up. And you can have, and this is the cool thing about early season is that you can kill that herd bull, that giant three fifty bull, or you can kill a raghorn doing this same method. Mm-hmm. And that's you. That's one of those cool treasures that you don't know what's going to happen because when stuff starts happening. And stuff starts coming in. You don't know if it's going to be the bull of a lifetime or just one of these little raghorn bulls. Because mm-hmm. it works the same way. So I'll do that. <clears throat> and then if I, if it if it's a if it's a bunch of bulls or whatever or that bull smell, then I will I will just simply take a a, a stick, you know, about that big. Yeah. But I'll find me a little green tree that's wispy you know mm-hmm. not this crash and cr- i'm not trying to accomplish that i'm not trying to to display my dominance i'm just trying to display 
I'm in the bedroom. Mm-hmm. I, I'm here. I'm in. I'm in your. I'm in your house. Yeah. Because whoever was here moved out. They didn't know what was there. Now, now I'm displaying. Okay, it's me. I'm whipping that tree. I'm. I'm grinding off some of my uh, velvety, itchy stuff mm-hmm. on the on the tree. And uh, so now, if it is if it is a little bachelor group of bulls, and they've moved off, and I'm doing this, now I've got their attention. Oh, he's one of us. Mm-hmm. So now, what I'm speaking is that hey, it's safe, and they'll come back and go. Oh well, we thought it was something else, but now we know it's one of us. And so they'll come in, and they'll sneak, and I'll I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll spend three or four minutes. There's been times when I've watched bulls that are raking a tree. Will sit on that tree for ten minutes and just nonstop. Really? Rip, oh, until there's nothing left but just a post in the ground, and they're huh. still rubbing it on. So yeah, so they you don't have to be you know don't just rub a few times and stop, uh, but rub rub enough to where hmm. you're really getting some attention out here, because once I hit that cow call, everything is now I've got everybody's attention. If there's anything in this canyon. Shh, they're all focused on this one place where that just came from. Mm-hmm. And now they're listening. Now they're, now I've got their attention. Now when I'm whispering and stuff, that tree and whipping it, whoosh, whoosh, they can hear that really, really, really well, a long ways away. And if I'm just making a little snap and crunch in there and I walk around the tree and I'll break a few branches, you know, but nothing aggressive. Mm-hmm. And so I'll just do that. And then I'll do that for 30, 40, 50 seconds, maybe a minute, and then just stop. And I'll listen, 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 because I'd say probably eight out of 10 times there will be, there will be an animal coming in, but you have to be patient because they're, they don't have any place to be. Mm -hmm. They, they're not on a schedule. They're not, they're not on a time schedule. I got to be to work at eight (laughs) o'clock in the morning (laughs) that they're, they're just, they're just living life. And so they might just graze, come up. And then you're not doing anything. So I just kind of keep them interested, you know, whip that tree a little bit more. And, uh, and maybe even by this time, because I am, because I am, um, displaying a bull at this moment doing Mm -hmm. the, the tree raking. A lot of times I'll just, I'll just grab a reed and I'll just, just do a real light. (laughs) just light lightweight but mm-hmm. they know it's a bull and so now i have the attention of all the bulls in the country and they're th- and they're they're coming up to dis- just to see what's going on in their in their living room you know mm-hmm. they, they know something's there and so i might spend 20 minutes there just doing that over and over and unlike later in the season i spend some time doing this display Mm-hmm. And then if nothing, 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 I will head off again until I see a fresh rub or I smell more elk and I know they're in here somewhere. I will, I will start all over again and do that same, same display, but you really have to pay attention because they're going to come in on a sneak. And a lot of times, especially like right at that first part of September. So we're now we're into like September two, three, four in there. Um, I will do more displays of as it as it's progressing because now now we're starting to get a little bit more territorial. Cows are going to start getting wrapped up in uh, by these um, satellite bulls mm-hmm. who are gathering cows and sometimes a bigger bull. But uh, usually the bigger bulls wait until the satellites do all the work and then they just go in there. Hey, run them off. <laughs> the, yeah, the pheromones in the in the air. Thanks for gathering up the girls. You're out. You know, <laughs> so you did all the work for me. And so now in that third or fourth uh, of September, now I'm starting to be a little bit more vocal, doing more of these. <laughs> Again, just lightweight. And if there's an if there's another bull anywhere in there, he'll usually do that same thing back to me. Mm. He'll just let me know that he's there. Mm-hmm. And now the game has to be played very gingerly, because he's probably he's probably knowing that I'm here. 
he's not ready for any confrontation necessarily, but he wants to know who's in the living room. They just, they just have to know. It's kind of like, um, there's times when I get out on, on a, on a point somewhere and mm -hmm. I'll bugle, nothing's happening. And I'll just practice my bugling, bugle, mm -hmm. bugle, bugle, bugle. And then all of a sudden, 15 bugles later, something answered me Yeah, because they can't help themselves. It's just like, <laughs> They're they're over there trying to bite their tongue, you know, not to say something, <laughs> but they can't help it. Yeah, because it's just it's that time of year. I know that's okay. I mean, I'm down here, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and I I know we're kind of maybe getting into more depth than, <laughs> than we need to, but but these are all important parts as you move into into the 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 big finale of the rut. Mm -hmm. But that first part, I I have really enjoyed that first part because. Uh, I've learned how to speak clearly what they are trying to accomplish in their in their living room. Mm -hmm. So, and I know we don't have time to keep going with this, but uh, but I think early season, since that's where we're at right now, I think that's that's tools that you can use mm -hmm. um, to get where you need to get because most people know how to just do the full on bugle and the grunt and the whole thing. Yeah. Um, that, but that part comes later. Well, most of you know how to do that already, but this mm -hmm. early part is, is critical. If you, if you've just taken off a week of work, you spend a thousand bucks worth of stuff to get your hunt together, um, gas money and broadheads and more arrows and yeah. more arrows and thousand dollar, two thousand dollar bow, you got stuff invested. Mm -hmm. So, You've taken the time to do it, then get out there and and know how to, rather than just going out there. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like hopefully something out there. I'm speaking your language. Yeah. Uh, so try to get in there and do, you know, do it do it right. Mm -hmm. But that's early season. It 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 pays to do what they're what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. In their in their rut. So for sure. Awesome. Well, I think that uh, it's about time for the store to open and all that fun stuff. So I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us for Erlen, And uh, I hope this was helpful for all of you guys. If you want to hear more about elk hunting, uh, we could probably do like 30 elk hunting podcasts. So, uh, and we probably will do more uh, regardless. So, but anyways, if you guys enjoyed this, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Um, if you're listening to us on podcast, uh, give us a review that helps us out a lot. And if you want any more information, Follow us on social media. You can join the larger muzzleloaders.com community. And we will see you guys on the next podcast. <laughs>